Hello and welcome to another edition of Ukraine This Week with me, Don Arleth. Make this your one-stop shop to track all the progress on the political and literal battlefield. Let's go ahead now and get started. In a bid to show Vladimir Putin that Ukraine's allies are there for the long run, NATO has begun talks to commit $100 billion in support for Kiev over the next five years. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg emphasized the need for support for Ukraine to transition from being predominantly based on short-term voluntary contributions to more stable long-term commitments by the alliance. The discussions took place in Brussels, gathering foreign ministers from NATO's 32 member states just ahead of the organization's 75th anniversary. This move comes in response to the increasingly dire situation on the battlefield in Ukraine, where Russian forces have recently gained an advantage due to a critical shortage of infantry and ammunition on the Ukrainian side. The Ukrainians are not running out of courage. They are running out of ammunition. We need to step up now to ensure our support is built to last. So in our meeting today, we discussed how to put our support on a firmer and more enduring basis for the future. Reports suggest that the multi-year plan could involve in funding up to $100 billion, though specific details have yet to be disclosed by Jens Stoltenberg. This scheme is, however, likely to face the veto of Hungary. The proposed plan entails NATO taking a coordinating role in the efforts of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, which consists of around 50 countries that have been active in rallying support for Ukraine throughout the conflict. Although the plan would not entail NATO directly supplying weapons to Ukraine, continuing the policy of providing only non-lethal aid such as the mining equipment, fuel and the medical supplies, it represents a significant step in the alliance's involvement in the war. In a significant political development, former President Petro Poroshenko has announced his intention to run for the presidency again. In an interview with Al Jazeera, the fifth president of Ukraine emphasized that his candidacy would depend on the conclusion of the ongoing war with Russia and the lifting of martial law. Petro Poroshenko mentioned that should Ukraine become a member of the European Union, he would consider running for the European Parliament. This statement indicates Poroshenko's broader political ambitions beyond national leadership, reflecting his commitment to integrating Ukraine more closely with European institutions. The former president, who led Ukraine from 2014 to 2019, underscored the need for victory before elections take place in the war torn country. Please don't afraid Ukrainian victory. Don't afraid Russian defeat. And Putin go as far as we together allow him to go. That's why for us is vital. Stop Putin. Don't have any illusion. Poroshenko's tenure as president was marked by significant challenges, including the annexation of Crimea by Russia and the onset of the conflict in eastern Ukraine. In the 2019 presidential election, Poroshenko was defeated by Volodymyr Zelensky, with the latter winning over 75% of the vote, compared to Poroshenko's slightly more than 24. The announcement of Poroshenko's intention to run again adds a new dimension to Ukraine's political landscape, especially with former advisor to Zelensky's office, Alexei Arestovich, also declaring his plans to run for the presidency. This signals a potentially competitive race, once conditions allow for an electoral process. Uh, the As Ukraine grapples with the challenges of the ongoing conflict and the risk of frontline collapse, President Volodymyr Zelensky urgently calls for international military aid to prevent strategic retreats and the loss of major cities. Meanwhile, Ukrainian intelligence has its sights set on the Kerch Strait Bridge, aiming to cut off the peninsula from the Russian mainland and make naval operations for the Black Sea Fleet untenable. Here's more. 
Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky recently expressed grave concerns over the delayed military support from international allies, specifically highlighting the precarious situation on the front lines. Zelensky warned that without the swift approval and delivery of a multi-billion dollar aid package from the US, Ukrainian forces may face no choice but to retreat, putting key urban centers at risk of falling into enemy's hands. All our diplomats have the same task, bolstering air defense for Kharkiv, the entire Kharkiv region, Sumer region and the southern regions is an absolute and urgent necessity. Zelensky's warnings come amid fears that even with the eventual release of U.S. Congress-approved aid, it might not be sufficient to prevent a significant tactical defeat. Such a setback could have broader geopolitical ramifications, potentially reinvigorating Western calls for negotiations that might ultimately benefit Russia, giving it leverage to reignite the conflict at a time of its choosing. Ukraine's military intelligence has, however, set its sights on a significant infrastructure target, the Kerch Bridge that connects occupied Crimea to mainland Russia. This focus is part of a determined effort to undermine Russia's logistical and naval capabilities in the Black Sea. Senior officials from Ukraine's HUR military intelligence service have been candid about their plans to attempt another strike on the bridge, signaling confidence in their ability to achieve this objective within the first half of 2024. Now let's take a look at what's happening along the front lines in Ukraine. Of course, uh, ammunition starvation is probably the biggest problem faced along the front lines in eastern Ukraine. Let's start off up in the north near Kupiansk. And up there, uh, Russian forces continue to try to make strategic gains near Sinkivka. Uh, on, on the north side of Kupiansk, uh, still unsuccessfully at the moment. Of course, there has been lots of heavy re equipment reported up there for many months now. Um, Russian forces unable to make gains and unable to cross the Oskil River to the north up near Dvorichne. Uh, however, they are pounding away constantly at Sinkivka. Now let's move on down south to where the action is really going on uh, down near Bakhmut and of course the strategic city of Chasiv Yar. Uh, now apparently according to the s different sources out there, open source intelligence, uh, the battle for Chasiv Yar is now underway, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, the Institute for the Study of War has geolocated Russian troops on the suburbs of Chasiv Yar. Uh, the Eastern Command for Ukrainian Forces has subsequently reported that those forces have been pushed back and that indeed there are no Russian forces in the suburbs of Chasiv Yar. But they are inching closer and closer uh, to that strategically important city which will lay the grounds to open up to other cities such as all the way up um, to Krematorsk which would be a big, big disaster. Now Ukrainian forces hold the numerical advantage there. Um, it is likely that Russian forces as they try to attack Chasiv Yar from lower ground, Chasiv Yar is up on higher ground, it's also surrounded by a canal, that will uh, be very beneficial for Ukrainian forces who are there. Some of the most experienced Ukrainian um, troops are there holding the city and will continue to do so. Ammunition will be a factor here at play. Uh, drone warfare also a big factor. Uh, here and has been for the last year or more ever since the fall of Bakhmut. Uh, now if we move down to the south near Avdivka, again the situation there not looking the best. Russian forces continue to push west and in fact uh, the battles around Tonenke have been absolutely fierce and if we look at deep state maps uh, as a good indicator of what's going on there along the front lines, the gray area beyond the Russian controlled lands has expanded, continuing to push westwards. Uh, Russian forces are taking heavy, heavy losses there in the thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers, as well as hundreds, uh, hundreds of pieces of heavy Russian equipment, such as tanks, uh, howitzers, self-propelled howitzers, and what have you. 
Um, looking overall at the situation down in the south in Kherson, the situation remains unchanged. The uh, bridgehead that the Ukrainian forces have across the Dnipro River is still just very, very small down near uh, Oleshki and there's still no breakthrough for Ukrainian forces there. Ammunition, well, that's going to be absolutely key to helping Ukraine hold off this Russian advance, and especially if they start another offensive coming up in the upcoming weeks and beginning of the summer. Now let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Now, before we get to our correspondent segment, brave eyes and ears reporting from Zaporizhia were seen scrambling in what appears to be a double tap strike in the southern Ukrainian city. Two Ukrainian journalists reporting for Ukraine Forum and One Plus One were injured in the strike. Let's take a look. And now it's time to look at the war in Ukraine through a journalist lens. And for that, I'm joined now by Oz Katerji who just returned from the front lines in the Donbass and Sumy. Hello, Oz. Thanks for joining us today. Good day. Uh, now, you just report, returned from the front lines there in the Donbass and in the Sumy region. Um, first of all, what were your overall impressions? I mean, what, what, what made the biggest maybe impression on you in this trip uh, as compared to times visiting the front line before? Um, yeah, look, the, the situation there is critical uh, when it comes to ammunition. Uh, they're running incredibly low um, across the entire front. Um, you know, I, I saw some of the, the bodies coming back uh, of Ukrainian soldiers from the front line. So I'm, I, I've seen the human toll that it's taking on on the soldiers there defending these lines. Um, yeah, it, it, it's not good right now, um, and and the, you know the point is to keep stressing this for Western uh, lawmakers so they understand just how bad uh, the situation is on the front line, and 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 that they are culpable for this situation. They are responsible for the fact that there are Ukrainian men being pulled off the front lines in body bags right now. 
Right, uh, and if I understand correctly, you were near the city of Liman and on the front lines there. Have you seen um, any noticeable movements forward by uh, Russian forces in that area? No, uh, I haven't seen any noticeable movements or heard of any noticeable movements in that particular stretch of the front. Mm -hmm. Further down south, there has been re uh, reports of the Russians making small advances. Uh, I mean, look, the, as I said, the situation is critical, but we're not looking at a, a major collapse uh, any time in the next uh, few weeks. So it's not, you know, uh, emergency situation. But as I said, it is critical. It's bad. Uh, and the situation has stabilized. The, the uh, Ukrainian lives, um, they, they had to uh, sacrifice men to, to be able to, to uh, stabilize their front lines because they don't have the ammunition. And, and if Russia pushes hard in a certain direction, the Ukrainians have no choice but to withdraw uh, because they don't have the ammo to hold those positions. So that's really the biggest thing. I mean, you, the front line may be in one position now, but that position is only really because the men are currently there holding it and they're not able to hold it. So they might be forced back depending on where uh, Russia dis decides to put pressure. Right. Uh, the situation we saw in Avdivka was quite dramatic just you know, over the last few weeks. Now Chassi Vyar, it looks like Russians are getting closer and closer there. Uh, you know, it was one year ago that Bakhmut fell. Uh, the Ukrainian forces have held on to Chassi Vyar. Chassi Vyar is going to be a strategically important city um, so the Russians don't reach uh, Konstantinivka and then further up to, 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 to Kramatorsk and whatnot. Uh, what is your, I don't know, assessment of the situation there? You think Ukrainians are going to be able to hold Chassi Vyar? So look, uh, here's, here's, here's the problem with this. Is I've heard com conflicting uh, reports from, you know, I haven't personally, the plan was to try and visit that part of the front line, but those plans didn't, didn't materialize. So all I can really go on is, is what I've been speaking to my friends who are reporting on the same situation. And there is a bit of a disagreement about uh, just how bad the situation is in Chassivyar. Uh, with some reckoning that 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 it's imminently uh, about to fall and that Ukrainians are going to have to be pulled out from there, uh, and others saying that actually no, that that they're they're not doing as badly as that. The the problem is Chasivyar is unlike Abdivka, Chasivyar is a lot more strategic and advantage uh, for whoever holds it. Uh, you know, if the Russians hold it, they'll be able to to have uh, fire control on on uh, critical parts of the Ukrainian front line. So. Um, the Ukrainians really don't want to lose Chasivyar, uh, but the problem is, again, uh, you can only hold these positions if you have the ammunition to defend them, and if you can't defend them, then you can't hold them. So, um, you know, unless something changes with the ammunition supply really soon, then it, it might be, uh, uh, they might have no choice but to withdraw from Chasivyar. So the situation is quite bad in that, in that region, the front line at least. Right. Well, uh, we're all hoping that the ammunition from Germany, uh, and of course, that Czech-led ammunition coalition hits the front lines, and I'm sure Chassis Vyar would be one of the first places it goes. Um, now, Oz, you're also up in the Sumi region. We're hearing about uh, evacuations of children from the border areas there. Uh, is there expectations that, that Russian, uh, Russians might uh, make an assault up in the Sumi region? So while I was there, I saw I saw two things. I saw one, I saw the uh, defenses that they were being built, and Zelensky recently visited them, like shortly after we did as well. So you'll you'll have a, a rough idea of of what they're doing. They're they're building trench lines uh, in expectation that if the Russians do try to uh, invade again from that area, that they will they will meet stiffer resistance than they did uh, the last time round. Um, the other thing I saw was. The, the the some of the border regions uh, and there are very few civilians left living there there are still some uh, and they're in quite a bad way so you know withdrawing and, and uh, pulling civilians out of them evacuating it is of priority because um you know the, these 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 towns are very difficult to uh, to defend given that they are just under you know routine shelling from across the russian border and and, and unless the Ukrainians plan to to push across that border. There's no real way to to stop the Russians from doing that. So evacuation is really the only 
choice they have at this point. Again, the, Ukraine's in a difficult position in, in that part of the country as well. They might not have to be dealing with an active Russian invasion, but they have to prepare for one. Right, and dealing with the constant shelling. Uh, Oz uh, Karaji, uh, reporting for us from Kiev, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. We appreciate it and stay safe. Thank you. And now in a move aimed at strengthening its armed forces, which has been worn down by two years of heavy fighting, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has signed a new law reducing the military mobilization age. Kiev wants to boost its forces by 300,000 before the up next upcoming Russian offensive. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has made a pivotal decision to lower the military mobilization age from 27 to 25, a step that could significantly bolster Ukraine's military personnel amidst the prolonged war with Russia. Moscow's substantial manpower advantage has been a consistent challenge for Kyiv, prompting this strategic adjustment to replenish its reserves following a notable decline in volunteer numbers. In December, Zelensky emphasized the need to mobilize an additional 500,000 soldiers to counter Russian forces effectively. This is a very serious number, and I said that I need more arguments to support this idea. This is a question about people, about justice, about defense capabilities, and a financial question. However, recent statements from the Ukrainian leader indicate a shift in strategy, suggesting that the required number of mobilized soldiers has been significantly reduced. This adjustment aligns with comments from Ukraine's top military officials, who have also noted a revised assessment of the necessary force size after a thorough review of available resources. Moscow has seen a significant increase in the number of people signing contracts to join the armed forces since last month's deadly attack on the Krokus concert hall. In a statement, Russia's defense ministry said more than 100,000 people had signed contracts with the military since the beginning of the year, including some 16,000 in the past two weeks alone. After the terrible events in Moscow, I don't want to stand aside. I don't want my own native town to see a tragedy like that. The military dynamics on the ground reveal a challenging scenario for Ukraine, which has been fortifying its defense against steady Russian advances, particularly in eastern Ukraine. As Kyiv prepares for the possibility of further Russian mobilization, the reduction in the mobilization age represents a crucial adaptation in the strategy to sustain its defense and initiative in the conflict. And now, here to join me to discuss this mobilization and its impacts is Ukrainian MP Yevhenia Kravchuk. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on Ukraine This Week. Hello, thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Now, we've had this conversation before, just before uh, the bill was actually passed. And, well, now it's been passed, um, so let's get to the details. Uh, 300,000, not a half a million, President Zelensky saying that that's all that Ukraine needs. It doesn't, it's not necessary to have uh, a half a million uh, fresh troops mobilized. Um, so why is, exact, why is that exactly? Um, just to, to make clear that the big uh, legislation uh, on mobilization, it's actually um, will be on vote in April. So it's an old bill that was voted in the parliament uh, nine months ago. And uh, okay. now uh, President Zelensky signed it. Why it wasn't uh, done uh, nine months ago? Uh, because uh, some of the preparations uh, needed to be done to be able um, uh, uh, to train these troops, uh, to finance uh, these new, you know, new, new troops in this two, uh, two year gap between 25 and 27. It's a, like, you know, new category that is introduced for the uh, mobilization. So we are still working in the parliament um, on the big bill. Now, okay. um, the whole uh, conversation about uh, troops mobilization numbers is actually very much connected to the previous piece you had on Chasiv Yar, on, um, you know, the front line. Uh, and as very rightfully uh, uh, mentioned by uh, your correspondent, we are losing troops that then had to be replaced, uh, replenished because of the, you know, uh, 
lack of the uh, ammunition and also the lack of air defense. Mm -hmm. So it's all connected. When um, someone, you know, asks from our Western partners, uh, so what are your plans with the mobilization? We also ask what are your plans with uh, the instruments uh, that these troops will have because there is no point to mobilize an, uh, a person and uh, give it, you know, a shotgun doesn't it will not work uh, on the aviation bombs or tank or whatever uh, from the russian side right so a... the numbers um, i cannot give you the the, the uh, you know the concrete numbers how, how many um, people will be drawn uh, taught and and sent to the front line every month or like a, a year because it's actually very sensitive uh, information, information and it's uh, due to the you know the the, the uh, command the military command how how to uh, plan it. But it's uh, also important that now the um, separate brigades are actually uh, launching the communication campaigns for the recruitment. So uh, basically, it's, it's now, um, I think it's a good uh, uh, story, communication story. Uh, if you come to, uh, to Ukraine, you would see, um, for example, advertisement um, on the streets. Uh, the concrete brigade needs this, this, and this. If you want to fight with us, you know, call, come, and um, I, I think it's also uh, very important to, to give this, uh, you know, not just uh, the, the mobilization that you get the document and you have to come and then um, you, you end up, you know, somewhere. But it's important to give the idea where this person will go, how um, uh, it will be trained, and, and what, you know, qualities uh, will be used in the best way. Right. Uh, that's really important to point out. Um, when you are in Ukraine, you get SMSs on your telephone uh, from various brigades uh, that have various requirements or various positions that they need to fulfill. Um, I've also seen that just not mobilization itself, but actually vo people volunteering for the armed forces has been the primary driver um, in, in people joining uh, the Ukrainian armed forces. And I think that's fantastic. But at the same time, I also have talked to tons of people on the front lines that are exhausted, completely exhausted of being there for the last two years in these positions. Um, and really, it, some, of the, some of these frontline fighters who have really just been fighting nonstop without a break do need a break. Um, I'm wondering, with this mobilization that you pointed out that's nine months old and probably should have been passed earlier, uh, when is the expected time that, that, that the soldiers will be trained? I mean, how long is training going to take uh, for soldiers under this package? Well, I, I'm not really a military expert in mm -hmm. this uh, case. I'm, I'm a lawmaker and um, actually not from, from the Committee on Defense. Uh, but also, uh, uh, it's um, uh, very important to understand um, uh, that now, after the change of the uh, chief of command, because, you know, that solution was changed for Sirsky, right. uh, another general, um, there was uh, uh, another um, tool introduced as uh, rotations. So uh, these uh, soldiers that are on the front line now get um, rotation so they can uh, just, you know, have more time in other region just to regroup, to, uh, to have rest. Right. And another brigade comes to the front line. Mm -hmm. And in these um, uh, um, uh, also audits that uh, the new chief in, com uh, in command made, we sort of found uh, at least 8,000 of people that are officers that are in the armed forces but never saw the front line. So basically, President Zelensky said that every uh, um, brigade has to uh, to have this uh, at some point a rotation on the front line. If it's the brigade that should be, um, you know, fighting on the front line, so another brigade could get the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, so w w we'll see. And another big question, which is being discussed in the parliament, is the demobilization. So uh, uh, it, what um, time? Uh, should we put in the um, legislation and how the procedure uh, should be done so the person won't get mobilization, you know, when they go and it starts like day one, when um, it will be uh, uh, demobilization. Right now, the approximate um, number that we see, it's, uh, it has to be at least 36 months, so three years. 
Uh, yeah, uh, of course, it starts the, the the timing starts for for those who uh, are fighting since the twenty fourth of February twenty twenty two. It's also very uh, tough um, uh, thing to tackle uh, because uh, if we want to do the demobilization, someone has to come on the place of the person that gets uh, demobilized. Certainly, uh, certainly. Well, I think it's really important to highlight uh, what you just said. Without NATO or without Western assistance to give you the ammunition equipment that you need uh, to be actively involved in the fight and, and pushing back on the Russians, uh, that assistance is needed much more uh, than, than, than mobilization. Well, Yevhenia Kravchuk, Ukrainian MP, thank you very much for joining us uh, and explaining thank this you. to us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. In a recent drone strike in Russia's Tartaristan region, orchestrated by Ukraine and reaching unprecedented distances, is just one element in the pivotal role drones are playing in the modern warfare. This evolution signals a future where unmanned systems could dominate military strategies and even entire conflicts themselves. In a bold demonstration of drone warfare capabilities, Ukraine has executed a daring attack deep within Russian territory, targeting the Tatarstan region over 1,300 kilometers from the Ukraine-Russia border. This operation, marking one of the furthest strikes into Russian soil since the war's onset, targeted areas of strategic and economic significance, including Yelabuga, where drone production is believed to occur, and an oil refinery in Nizhegamsk. Russian terrorists are receiving responses to their strikes, each time longer-range responses. The plant was a key site for foreign investment and reported assembly point for Iranian Shahid drones used against Ukraine, despite local authorities in Tatarstan downplaying the impact, claiming no serious damage and uninterrupted production, Ukraine's military intelligence reports significant destruction at the Yelabuga facilities. These operations come amidst Ukraine's warnings of severe ammunition shortages and ambitious plans to bolster its drone production to a million units this year. This strategic shift towards unmanned warfare is not only a response to immediate logistical challenges, but also a testament to the evolving nature of combat, where drones offer a means to extend operational reach, minimize risk to personnel and achieve precise strikes. The incident in Tatarstan, coupled with recent drone sightings near Moscow and attacks on critical infrastructure far from the front lines, highlights the escalating use of drones in modern warfare. This trend is likely to continue, reshaping the landscape of warfare where distance and borders become less protective against the reach of modern technology. And now here to discuss the critical role that drones are playing on the battlefield is retired U.S. Navy Captain Gary Tabak. Hello and thanks for joining us on uh, Ukraine This Week. Hello, TVP. Very happy to be with you. Yes, well, it's great to have you. And actually, this is quite an interesting segment. If we look at uh, all the developments that we've seen come out of Ukraine with drones this week, um, it really is quite amazing. Um, I think, though, we should start probably with the naval drones and how significant they've been. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of this information is secret uh, just from uh, Ukrainian armed forces themselves uh, not liking to give up a lot of the uh, secretive details. But I think we can infer that um, a homegrown Ukrainian uh, naval surface drone has been quite effective on on wreaking havoc on the Black Sea Fleet. Um, and so now this is something we've really never experienced before. Uh, do you think that Ukraine with drones alone is going to be able to destroy another third of the Black Sea f Fleet? Well, as a naval officer, uh, I certainly hope so <laughs> that they will do that. Uh, definitely the warfare, uh, at least on um, at sea and in the air, has changed. Uh, we see that the Ukrainians are sinking Russian ships with their drones and unmanned vehicles. And uh, we see them shooting down Russian airplanes that are not supposed to be, you know, were uh, 
we were told that they, they, they can't be shut down. So we have uh, a war and we have uh, one side that has no fleet, yet it's sunk, the fleet of its enemy. <sighs> we see uh, one side that has no air force in, in, in general and has been able to destroy the air force of the enemy that is pretty advanced. So yes, the warfare has changed and Ukrainians are very good at improvising. If you don't give them something or if they don't have something, they will create it. And I've seen many young men, women, uh, older ladies sitting in a type of a garage or a basement and making those things with a 3D um, you know, printers and so forth. Making it, I mean, the public. You know, during World War II, my grandmother used to uh, knit uh, mittens and the wool socks for the soldiers at the front. Well, today those grandmas sitting there and they're knitting with the 3D printers uh, parts uh, for those unmanned vehicles and uh, the weaponry. Certainly very innovative. Now, uh, we showed this at the beginning of our report. Let's see if we can get this up. Uh, this is what people were speculating was a Cessna drone. Uh, let's see if we can get that on there. Hitting uh, hitting an oil refinery um, in Russia, carrying quite a payload there. Um, I think subsequently it came out that it wasn't quite a Cessna, uh, but could that be the next big idea for Ukrainian armed forces, like donate your old aircraft, it only needs to fly one way, uh, and Ukraine can outfit it and, and make it effective in striking Russian territory? Well, you know, they, they, um, um, uh, my uh, Beef with uh, my government was that we have so many Humvees that we uh, that are out of service already in the United States military, sitting in Europe, and we're not giving them to the, to the uh, Ukrainian forces for some unknown reason. So we, the volunteers, keep buying those old pickup trucks that, that we call them Bandera mobiles. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, these boys, you know, put like uh, metal sheets on it and they advance with them and uh, they push the Russians, they repel the Russian attacks with them. They improvise very well. So if we give them those old pickup trucks, why not give them old airplanes or old boats that they can convert to the unmanned vehicles that will attack the Russians? And, and of course, this is a war. In a war, there are always advances. There are always uh, uh, things that... Um, uh, uh, brilliant people develop to kill each other or right. in medicine their advances also in medicine i must say so yes this is a becoming more and more uh, of a combination of world war one uh, with a trench war and uh, the futuristic mm -hmm. war 21st drone. century yeah yeah right. so it's a combination of those two things and the more and more those drones are becoming more essential and many people are talking about the ones that will uh, when this war and advance are the ones that will be able to produce more of those uh, uh, drones and unmanned vehicles that will be operating in, in the air, on the land, and at sea. Right. Um, now let's take a look at this, uh, which just happened, this multiple drone attacks destroy six aircraft and damage eight at the Morozovsk airfield on Friday. That's a 1,200 kilometers deep uh, into Russian territory. Drone music. Um, it looks like, who knows, maybe Ukraine doesn't need an air force to destroy the Russian air force. Maybe it just needs a drone force. Well, they, uh, uh, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, it would be funny if it wouldn't be a war. It's a drone with the music that's playing. It's like Apocalypse Now when they turn Wagner, you know, the, the, the ride of the Valkyrans. And uh, the, uh, no, they need air force. They need air force as anti-missile uh, defenses that because the Ukrainian skies are not closed. Uh, Russians are firing missiles at the hospitals, at the infrastructure, at the, uh, at the facilities that are uh, uh, he, uh, provide water, heating, and, uh, and electricity, and they're destroying this uh, network of the um, of the utilities right. so the, the uh, that that is creating a huge problem they're firing on the dams 
which is equivalent to a nuclear attack because the, the environmental and human disaster that it could cause is just immense if all those dams will blow up in Ukraine. Well, it's, it'll be worse than a nuclear, I think, uh, attack. So they, they need Air Force. They need Air Force very badly to provide protection of their skies. That The drones will not be able to do that. Right. You know, we, we're coming up now with a, a sixth generation airplanes or seventh generation aircraft that will be unmanned and manned. So it will function as both. You can put a pilot there that will fly it and, and do whatever it needs to do or it can fly by itself and conduct the mission. Right, so well, the, the F-16s, hopefully the F-16s uh, bring some relief in the near term until we get to those um, um, those newer generations. And, and just to add one thing, it's just recently the Ukrainians were able to repel a Russian uh, armor attack, big, a whole battalion, 31 tanks and armor personnel carriers, and they've destroyed them with drones and uh, javelins and uh, stugnas and uh, they just killed them. Well, and look at this. Let's take a look at this next one we have. We have a few of these. Uh, this is also blowing my mind. This is a, a hexcopter that's actually used for um, putting pesticides on, on farmers' fields. Um, it's, it can carry quite a payload, and the Ukrainians have outfitted it with, um, with heavy machine gun and RPGs. And, of course, in this footage here that we see right now, uh, this is t captured from a Russian drone um, showing this hexcopter in action. Uh, the innovation seems endless, almost. I, I, I'm wondering um, where this stops <laughs> because we keep seeing these. We also see these um, self-propelled tracked uh, mini uh, drones that are deployed along the front lines, the zero lines, the line of contact in the trenches. Uh, with explosives and whatnot, um, as well as I've seen uh, these automatic machine guns on turrets, uh, which are remotely uh, controlled. Um, is There's this a, the future of warfare? No, it's absolutely it's a future. Well, it's not a future. It's a warfare of today. Oh, today, already the future. The future is here. The problem that there is no deficit or shortage of innovation and ingenuity in Ukraine by the very, very bright people who can do this. The problem is uh, not the quality, but the quantity. They cannot produce that in, 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 a, in mass production. So uh, uh, the Russians can. Russians have way more. The it, a year ago, Russians had less drones than the Ukrainians. Now they have way, way more. And the Ukrainians are saying that they can't really lift their head up because there's constantly in the air thousands of those drones are flying and they can uh, suppress them or spoof them because they don't have enough equipment. Yet that equipment exists in Ukraine. It's just a matter of production, production. just a matter of investment in it and the, and the military industry to create that. And I'm, I don't understand why the, we in the West cannot help to do that. Right. Um, I've spent a significant amount of time in Ukraine since the full-scale invasion and I've uh, talked with many soldiers about this. And there's some of them that I keep in touch with right now say that um, actually the leading cause of death right now is uh, along the front lines, is getting to the front lines and not being attacked by FPV drones in your car. Um, I want to show now uh, on a sadder note the attack from this last week on Thursday in Kharkiv. Uh, what appears to be a double tap strike by drones, Shahid drones most likely. Um, so let's take a look. Let's see. Uh, now those strikes killed uh, killed first responders and injured injured several people. Absolutely terrifying what we're seeing there, um, and that goes exactly to your point that Ukraine needs to well if it's developed these these electronic warfare systems that are able to jam the drones and and take or even take over their signal right they need to de be deployed in large numbers. They um, have them. They have just a, it's just a matter of numbers and, and uh, timing of the production.
I was just in Kharkiv and, and I'm going back there uh, in a couple of days. Yeah, it is absolutely horrible that the beautiful city that I remind people that has uh, in, in during World War II changed hands between Soviets and Germans six times and the destruction was not anywhere nearly as it is now of that city. Unfortunately, it's so close to the Russian border that they don't have time to intercept many missiles and Shahids. Uh, so the, the, the Russians could continue to destruct the, the, the city and destroy it. Uh, the people are being evacuated from there and the defense of Kharkov is, is utmost. But I have to uh, applaud and uh, uh, say a few things about the municipal workers of Kharkov because I see them responding to those things very quickly. If the heat is off, they fix it very quickly. Tristio, right. they fix it they, they uh, get it back online very, very quickly. But the Russians are now starting to conduct a terrorist type of events. So they fire first, then the responders come there, the municipal workers come there to uh, to fix things and to get it back online, and then they fire on them exactly. and kill those people. So yeah, it is terrible. definitely terrorist tactics. It is it is terrible. It is terrible. Yes. Well, with that, sir, uh, Gary Tabak retired. Uh, a Navy captain, thank you very much for joining us and discussing this important topic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. And that's all the time we have on Ukraine this week. Thank you for joining us and please join us again on next Saturday. See you then. Goodbye.